recording on. So welcome to Community Conversations. We're excited to have another, another monthly conversation about COVID-19 and um, hopefully a little bit of good news this month and some uh, good framing on how we also start to enter the holidays. So we'll start off with Dr. Dale Reisner who is the medical director at Swedish Health Services and board member at Health Advocate X. Dr. Reisner. Thursday. Hi there. Um, so I um, am pleased to be back. Um, we had a fabulous annual meeting and um, uh, covered uh, a number of topics around COVID and post COVID and ongoing pandemic. Um, and we'll continue to address those with these community conversations as time goes along because the impact is long reaching. Um, I'll start with the numbers. Um, and uh, from a global perspective, there's now over 251 million cases of uh, COVID-19, um, there've been more than 5 million deaths. Um, in the US, we're over 47 million cases and uh, 761 deaths. So it's high, really high. Um, Washington state, I, like, I always like to put that into perspective because a fair number of you are from here. Each state is easily accessible through CDC. Um, and um, if you're interested in details about your state, there's lots of information, case rates, um, uh, rates amongst minorities um, and, um, and other types of um, information, hospitalization rates and so on. So for Washington state, we're, um, you know, we were at the, the sentinel state in terms of identification. I'm not sure that we were really the very first case in the country uh, looking back at some of the virology data that we know about, um, but uh, over 750,000 cases in Washington state and over 8,900 deaths. Um, many of these in highly vulnerable populations, but not all. Um, so what we've seen in the US over, they, what we look at is a rolling average, seven day rolling average. And um, there had been a little bit of a plateau over the last week across um, the US. Um, there's been a slight increase, about 20% increase in cases. Um, and um, most of the other countries in the world are plateaued. So the US is um, outstanding in ways that uh, we really don't wanna be. Um, there are pockets, obviously some places where it's very um, plateaued and others where um, there's still a lot of activity. Colorado has gotten very, very um, um, high rates recently. And there's a lot of focus on changing the, the um, governor's um, recommendations for that state. Um, the good news is that um, the projections across the country, um, there's a website you can uh, log into, it's IMHE. And if you just put that in your um, search engine, you, you can get to the University of Washington research branch that does projections. And what's really interesting is their projections have been quite close to what we've seen. Um, they will always project worst case and best case scenario. Best case scenario is if we all wear our masks. Um, so masking, social distancing, still hand washing, all of those things still are gonna help us. And, um, and what is projected is that um, across the country, um, and you can look at your particular state on the IMHE, it's not just for Washington, um, it will give you a global, national, and, and your state. Um, we're expecting some plateaus, but our plateau now is where we were when we had our spike in the spring of this year. So when Delta came along and hit hard, that's our plateau. That is not anywhere close to as low as we have been since the initial um, pandemic started. And so we have to keep that in mind because it's the newer um, mutations are more transmittable. And, um, and so you can be fully vaccinated and pick it up. Um, you may be less symptomatic. You definitely will have a lower risk for hospitalization um, and or death. Um, and um, I'm not gonna go into boosters and some of the other things we can talk about that maybe next time. Um, but there's um, lots of information about um, 
the increase in vaccination rate across the country, which I think is amazing. So I just want to put that into perspective and I'll hand it off pretty soon to our guest speaker. But um, in the United States now, we're very close to 70 percent, 68 percent of um, of folks in the United States are, are now at least one dose of vaccination. Um, complete two doses or J and J with its one dose is 54%. So really a lot of recent uptake, I think that's been in younger ages. Um, it's really fabulous to see these um, teenagers just jumping in and getting their vaccinations. Um, you know, they're motivated. They can't do their fun social stuff. So yeah. if they're sick or if they're quarantined. So can, I think that's Can I really ask awesome. you just, can I yeah. ask you a quick question, Dale? Um, so um, how, how close are we to herd immunity or is that a thing or? You know, it, it's, um, Herd immunity typically is around 80%. Um, either in, uh, previously had infection or um, covered with vaccination. The hard part with this one is that shorter period of time that we think that the vaccinations cover and the ease of someone who had the wild virus getting sick again um, if they're not vaccinated. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a little bit more challenging with this. I think that masking and hand washing um, obviously are going to be important for us for this as well as for prevention of flu. And I was just going to mention that our flu vaccinations are not as high as they usually are, but our flu rates are low in general, except New Mexico is on fire with the flu. So, you know, anytime you get a flu like illness, of course, um, you're going to get evaluated either with COVID or flu both. There's combo tests now that are really helpful that have uh, respiratory syncytial virus, flu, and, and COVID. Um, so if you do get, uh, get tested for all of that, um, and I just offer the combo test. But yeah, I think we're, um, it's, it's because this is so infectious, uh, I think our standard herd immunity stuff may be a little bit more nebulous than, than what it's been in the past. Um, and so I, I just wanted to um, kind of finish up with, you know, the pediatric population five to 11 has been approved um, by the CDC. They're encouraging it. Um, there are many pediatric care providers and clinics that are tooling up to do that. They feel like they may do a better job because they're used to working with kids than, than these mass vaccination sites that we had. Um, and um, so they, it, that rollout might look a little bit slower, um, but school age kids, of course, there many parents are very motivated to have their kids covered. Um, and then the one other population that I have to talk about, because it's my specialty is pregnancy. And we're still way behind on pregnant women um, getting vaccinated. They are worried that it's not safe for their babies. Getting COVID is the worst in terms of safety for their babies during pregnancy or immediately afterwards. And we have great information increasing in numbers of the amount of um, women that are vaccinated during pregnancy, the amount of antibody that's present at time of birth and also that's carried through. So it's present in the belt, breast milk, it's present in the cord blood. And there's no sign of babies having any impact at all or the pregnancy itself. So we'll stop with that. And then if there's further questions at the end, certainly happy to answer that, but really want to turn it over to Lori. Uh, we need to take you off mute, Lori. Gotta love technology, happens yeah. all the time. <laughs> um, okay, let me get this, my slide deck here, just into presentation mode and I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, we can, okay, thank perfect. you. Let me just hit present mode. That should be a little better there. Perfect. Okay, and you're seeing just the presentation, right? The PDF? Correct. Okay, great, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad I was asked to be able to speak about um, this topic. Um, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a really important topic, uh, the topic of burnout, you're probably hearing a lot more about it lately, and it is definitely 
you know, very near and dear to my heart. And we'll get into a little bit more about that why. But um, I just think that, you know, we already were starting to face burnout and then being in the middle of a pandemic of a global scale has definitely tested all of human beings, I think, with burnout to some degree. And I'm sure that you have all experienced or maybe even currently experiencing burnout given just the, you know, the sacred and I think the demanding work that a lot of you are doing. Um, my burnout story is very different than the stress and the burnout that you all are experiencing in the healthcare system, given just the severity of your work. And I just want to be clear that I don't want to pretend to know the stress and the pressures of your work. Um, but together, I just think that we all need to go through the process of understanding what burnout really is and what it truly means to live in a world with a burnout epidemic happening all around us. And I think we can all kind of re-educate ourselves and start learning more about this burnout and the kind of the role that we can all play in, you know, stopping the spread of burnout. Um, and I just, I, I would be remiss if I just didn't say um, for all of you that are on this call that are in the healthcare capacity, um, I know there's so many different roles and things that you're doing, but just Honestly, thank you for all that you do from the bottom of my heart. Um, you know, my heart and empathy and compassion and gratitude just go out to all of you. Um, I recently lost um, my uncle to a massive stroke and brain hemorrhaging. And the care that was extended to him in the ICU was honestly the only piece of comfort, comfort that um, our family had. So again, I just wanna say thank you for all that you do. So um, today we'll talk about, really, I'm going to talk about the definition. There is a true definition for burnout and the differences between um, what stress and burnout are, because there are differences between those. And then we'll review some numbers and some data and talk a little bit about organizations and individuals in terms of how you can support um, that burnout dilemma. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So. Um, let me just go, I want to make sure, there you go, okay. Um, I love this quote, I, I, I'm known for quotes with a lot of my clients, but this one just really stands out for me. Um, burnout is what happens when we try to avoid being human for too long. Um, I don't know if that resonates with some of you, the understanding of that. And this definitely, I can relate to this. Um, this was me, absolutely, this was me. I wanted to share a little bit about my story as to why you have the burnout coach talking with you here today and how I became the burnout coach. I think it's important to quickly touch base on that and why I decided to dive into this work. Um, I worked for Fortune 500 companies and I rose to senior leadership positions both at booking.com and Amazon. I was in HR and recruiting roles and I've always felt really fortunate to have those opportunities, but after working 60 plus hour work weeks and constant travel, I knew that I began feeling burnt out and just physically depleted. I was, I felt really detached from myself, if that makes sense. Uh, I knew I wasn't happy. And I always just had this um, gnawing, like panic and anxiety. And it was when I was at my previous job um, at booking.com when I really had like my true aha moment. And it was during a year where I had flown over 50,000 miles. We had a corporate office that was based in Amsterdam. And I was running the whole recruiting team for the Americas. So imagine traveling from Peru up to Canada, to New York, to California, to Chicago, Michigan, back down to Mexico City, Amsterdam a couple of times. Um, it was, it just started to wear on me for sure. And I was in Florida on a work trip and I was doing a training and I had one day where I was in my room and I had to write 10 performance reviews. And I ran out in the morning to get some decongestant medication and boom, I was in a car accident. Somebody hit the back of my car. And at the time it wasn't super serious or so I thought. Um, I fast forward, I returned to Seattle, started doing some chiropractic care among some others, but I just wasn't taking my recover my recovery seriously at all. Um, and it honestly took me five months of just being very, very stubborn. And it finally caught up to me. I had a frozen shoulder. I could barely lift my left shoulder. And 
I was crying all the time. I was anxious all the time. I couldn't focus at work. Um, I just wasn't doing anything my doctors were telling me to do because I was so busy and I just didn't have time. And I always thought, hey, work is just so much more important. I finally decided to take a three month leave of absence. And this is when I decided to focus on me. And I took this leave of absence and it was, it was difficult because what I realized when I stepped back was that how just absolutely tethered we are to our laptops, our cell phones. And honestly, it was the need to be needed for me personally. I just, that was so important to me. That just drove me in my work. And I sat back and reflected and realized that I just lost sight of my true self. Like everything became about work. It was literally my whole identity as a human being. And so I realized for me that while corporate America is, is great, it just wasn't great for me anymore. I just, I couldn't continue to keep going at the pace I was going. So with that, I decided to quit my job and I took a year off and I did a coaching certification program that really did change my life forever. And now I'm just super happy about dedicating my career to helping clients abandon burnout and work on burnout prevention and just embrace authenticity and balance and joy um, in their lives. So that's a little bit about me and how I got into this work. People say, wow, the burnout coach, how did, did you go to school for that? How did you become the burnout coach? So I think it's important to kind of share my story that gives a little bit of street cred about um, the work that I'm doing. So and um, with that, we'll dive into, there we go, some, I wanted to talk about just some numbers, kind of um, burnout numbers and data. Um, currently, there are, we have over about 42.1 million Americans who actually quit their job in 2019. And we, it's been greater than 4.2 million people who handed in their two weeks notice just in August alone. So this is, these are, this is data and numbers from across the US. Um, we're in a time right now that is being referred to as the great resignation. I'm sure you've heard some of that potentially on, on the news or read about it. And just from April to August alone this year, at least 2.5 million Americans have quit the workforce altogether, just saying I'm quitting my job or I'm gonna go do something different. And these levels for 2021, and we're only at these were these were given through August are already at 15% higher than they were in 2019. So it's kind of eye opening. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are feeling some of the pressures of losing some of the best out there in terms of what's going on. Um, these are a few more um, numbers. There's a company that's called Visier, and they support organizations and companies in people analytics and running surveys. So. This was a survey that was done, a burnout survey across a thousand employees across the US in, in various different careers. And here are just some of the results of what we found um, that it's clear less than half the people realize that just by taking time off or taking a vacation, here's burnout. Um, obviously that doesn't happen. 89% uh, of those people have actually experienced burnout. And this is a piece that was interesting to me. Um, 70% of the people said that they would leave their job for one that offered resources to reduce burnout. So there's this really big trend right now going from, it's just the individual's responsibility of burnout, that it's like, it, it's just a me thing to it's a us thing. It really is um, companies and organizations are really starting to look at what can we do and that realizing they have a responsibility as well in, in looking at reducing burnout. Um, this is one that I pulled some information because I wanted to give some healthcare and get a little more specific instead of just speaking about um, corporate America. So these are some burnout by the numbers. There was um, a recent survey, roughly 21,000, that was done in Minneapolis of healthcare workers. And it showed that 38% have been experiencing anxiety or depression, 43 are work, you know, suffering from work overload and 49% were experiencing burnout. Um, and the stress scores were the highest among nurses, respiratory therapists, nursing assistants, housekeepers, as well as among women, black Latinx health workers. So this is definitely showing up heavily in specific sectors. Um, 
the interesting piece again, leading to the fact that the organizations are starting to, you know, understand their responsibility in some of this is that the odds of burnout were 40% lower in those who felt valued in their organization. So I think that's important just to notice, you know, some things and some trends in terms of what we can start to do to support that. Um, this one was a little scary and I'm sure you guys have seen some of this firsthand. Um, this was a um, data that was pulled out of the Australian Medical Association that 47% of training doctors said that they had made clinical error due to fatigue and just burnout and everybody, you know, literally it's like everything is on fire, especially at the very beginning of COVID when it's all brand new, you know, there's no playbook for this, I'm sure as you all experience and not knowing exactly, you know, what to do. So just knowing that, um, you know, burnout is definitely serious. It can lead to other things, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, that is absolutely happening out there. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be grim, but this is really the stark truth and why it's important to start to pay attention to burnout because oftentimes the signs of burnout just go unnoticed. People just think, oh, we're just stressed out. It's normal, we'll get through this, you know, it's fine. Um, and it's not necessarily the case. So a um, couple things I just wanted to point out there. I don't know if you guys are aware or have heard of, you might have the story of Dr. Lorna Bren, who it was a story in the New York Times. This emerged at the beginning of COVID and she was an emergency room physician in New York Presbyterian Hospital. She'd been on the front lines um, of the COVID-19 surge at the very beginning. And she contracted the virus herself she uh, confided in her family and friends that she had anxiety and exhaustion and just feeling very uncertain and overwhelmed for her patients, but also for herself. And she also spent a um, short time actually in the psychiatric ward to get support. And after recovering, she returned back to work. She was facing back-to-back -back shifts, multiple locations. And within a few days of that, she was gone. She actually died by suicide in April of 2020. So her family is out there really talking about the importance of we need to make it more um, just known and okay to talk about the fact that there are mental health support that's definitely needed in, in the profession. So um, there's a lot of information on these slides and just know you guys that I'm gonna make sure Robin gets a copy of the slide presentation. So you will be able to have access to that and to the data and there's hyperlinks in there so you can see everything. Um, let's see here, okay. I wanted to get in, talk a little bit about just really kind of defining burnout. So burnout was actually started to get defined in 1974, but I really like the way that the World Health Organization is defining it now because it's becoming more and more clear that it's really not just an individual situation again of the employee, but it really is more about the organization and, you know, where people are working at. So as a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has um, not been successfully managed. And they put it in kind of their three um, buckets um, or dimensions of it, which are feeling, feelings of energy um, depleted and exhausted, increasing mental distance from one's jobs, or feeling negativism, negativism or cynicism. And then the third is um, reduced professional efficacy, which clearly in healthcare is scary. Um, and so again, it is really about talking about burnout is really, it's, it's your organization. It's not just you as a person, as a human being alone, which I think is important too, to be able to talk about and have people start to um, sense and feel and realize that it's not all just about them, but, you know, the individuals where they're engaged at and working in. Um, this slide's pretty important because I, I've actually often had a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I just, I think I'm stressed out. I don't know. I might be burned out. I don't know. Is there even a difference? What does it all mean? Um, there is actually, a, oops, sorry, got a little excited there in the slides. There we are. Um, Burnout may be the result of unrelenting stress for sure, but it's not the same as too much stress. What I mean by that is stress involves 
too much. So you have too many pressures that demand too much of you physically and mentally. However, stressed out people still imagine that they can just get everything under control and that they'll feel better as soon as they can get everything done and that that stress will go away. Burnout, on the other hand, is about not enough. So being burnt out means feeling empty, mentally exhausted, honestly devoid of motivation, sometimes even beyond caring. And um, that's, you know, usually aware, people are aware that they're feeling stress or symptoms of stress, but you don't always notice burnout when it's happening. And a couple other symptoms of burnout might include um, headache, poor sleep, sadness, anxiety, social withdrawal, fatigue. So it's obviously really important, I think, to pay attention and, you know, know these signs before it's too late, before these things start happening to you. So we've talked a lot about burnout, kind of what it is, I've defined it, and I wanted to kind of take it up to a, a little more positive tick there and talk about, okay, great, now we know it's out there. Is there anything we can do about it or do we just have to live with it? Um, so um, there's lots of things that can be done. This is just one snippet, just one example I found, because obviously this slide deck would be a million uh, slides if I talked about just all the resources and everything that's out there and all the data on burnout. But this was a little, I wanted to get a little more, again, specific to healthcare industry. And this is something that um, people are doing. And if you're already doing some of these things, that's awesome. I'm glad to know that, you know, things are happening out there for people to be cautious of and realize that burnout is happening. So the first thing was just meeting basic needs. And one example was having healthy food easily available was rated as actually the highest as a helpful intervention for people who are working in the ER or in an ICU setting. Another thing is streamlining communications. So um, another example of this is including maybe creating checklists or for leaders on how to be clear and transparent in their communications and also just acknowledging the uncertainty in those communications. You know, again, I know everybody's been learning through this pandemic. There's no textbook. There's no way to know exactly how to handle it. We kind of take things as they go day by day. Another is allowing for reflection and processing, um, which I think is really important. Um, this is about creating opportunities for people to have shared experiences and talk about what they've been going through for the past year. And so kind of creating a support group for employees, if you will. Another one is to make it okay to get help. Um, you know, many people that um, say that they had personal access to mental health care said that they would, it would be more helpful during a time, especially during a pandemic. And going further to just normalizing help seeking, that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I always say that there's nothing weak about asking for help, even when you're the helper. I think it's probably even more important. And then the other piece is just measuring and sharing results. So it's all in an effort to kind of fix things and, and get better, but it's about sharing transparently so that everyone knows what's going on. So that's just one um, piece to it. And then there are a couple other things I found out there that are supportive for healthcare specific. I'm sure you guys are aware of these on the American Medical Association website. And it's not to say, I don't wanna make it sound easy, like, hey, just you know, get Headspace. You can get Headspace for free if you're an AMA member and it, you know, meditation cures burnout. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all, but I do know from personal experience and working with my clients that taking medical or sorry, taking like mindful moments um, does help you recharge. And it's, I think it's certainly important to, you know, improve state of mind. So you can also do, there's other things, there's things you can sign up for. There's Spotify playlists that I found out there. There's also emails that you can get on daily burnout tip of the day. So there are things that are, that are out there. Okay. Um, so this was just something I want that was, I saw that was pretty important. And Christina Mount, Matt Maslich is, um, she's an expert on burnout. And she says that research on burnout points to a different response 
we should focus on helping the workplace modify its sources of stress. In other words, fix the job, not the person. So it's just becoming really prevalent out there that, hey, companies and organizations and places of employment really do have a responsibility in this to kind of help. And it's not just the individual who is working in these health conditions that says, oh, it's all me. Um, real quick, I'll share a story. I just remember when I was working at Amazon, again, just going crazy, managing a huge team. And I went to my manager once and I just said, you know, and I was, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed to even have to go to her. And I just said, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this right now. I am just feeling, you know, so burnt out. And her message to me was literally, well, that's too bad. Just get in line. We're all burnt out. You need to just figure it out and do the work. That was the, the care that I got at that point. And I just remember thinking, wow, I mean, I know I can't be the only one that's working in Amazon that is feeling this way. And it's kind of a shame that they're not doing anything to address this. And this is how, you know, they're responding to the situation. So, okay, we talked a little bit about organizational help, but I really did want to talk a little bit more to about um, individual support, right? So how, what can we do, some things that we can do to help ourselves? Um, and this is really speaking from my own experiences in terms of what's helped and a lot of the work that I'm doing with my clients and stuff that I share with them around things that we can do. And again, this isn't going to wipe out burnout for all of us, but this is just taking one baby step. I just think about, you know, if you can do one little small thing for yourself to help, you got to do something because we can't just stay in the same situation of feeling this nonstop burnout. So here are just a couple things that that support my clients and that support me, but really it's about, I think when you're feeling this angst, you know, and feeling like potential burnout, it really is important to slow down to really notice what you're feeling and experiencing. And the key to this, that's so crucial is doing this judgment free, not making it, you know, bad. If we take a moment for ourselves, it's not selfish. You know, I always think, if I'm an empty well, if I'm, I'm a coach that just never does self-care, doesn't take care of me at all, I have nothing to give back to my clients. So it really is important to kind of fill that tank, if you will, to make sure that we can keep doing the work that we're doing. And um, the other thing is don't bury it and just carry on like it's not important. And it's okay to talk to somebody, you know, a colleague, family member, a therapist. And the other thing which people have a really hard time with is setting boundaries and practicing saying no. Um, even if it's something really small, it's still really important practice to um, start doing in order to make sure that you can set boundaries and take care of yourself. Because at the end of the day, if we're not doing this for ourselves, nobody else is going to do this for us, right? Um, and making you important. You guys are all doing such impactful work and it is always about taking care of everybody else. And it's really clear that you have to stop for a minute to just put you on top of that list. Again, if we're not doing this for ourselves, nobody else out there is probably gonna be doing that for us. Um, the other thing, one of the biggest things that supported me when I was going through my burnout was just practice and self-compassion. It's one of those things where we take care of other people all the time and we always forget you know, where it's like, we're on the very end of bottom of the list and gratitude can support as well as mindfulness. Um, and the last piece that I really emphasize a lot is just realizing that self-care is not self-indulgent. You know, it, it doesn't mean that um, you don't care about other people. It's just that we have to take moments for ourselves, or it's not going to work. We're going to have severe burnout. And then one other resource I wanted to share, this is something that um, I share a lot in my work with my clients. It's a great book uh, that just talks about burnout and stress and how to reduce those stress cycles that we get into. Um, and they're basic things. Again, it's all about taking baby steps. We can't start doing everything all at once. I know that's not possible, but just taking a baby step. So doing things like stopping for a couple minutes and just honestly taking deep breaths. Um, positive social interaction is something else. If you can do something, it's been really hard with COVID, obviously not to be able to get out there and be with people. But I think with, you know, vaccinations and being outside, it's starting to come back a little bit, which I'm hopeful for. 
um, that we can be together with people. I know for me, that was the hardest thing during COVID because I am such a relationship person. I love being with people. So that was really hard. Um, laughter, honestly, affection. And my actual favorite is just a big old cry. Um, honestly, just getting it all out there instead of just pushing it down. That's the worst thing we can do for ourselves and creative expression. Um, so these are just ideas again of some other things that, that we can do. And um, when I think about this, I just, I'm, I'm a person, I love analogies. It just helps me see the world easier uh, in my brain. And I remember being at a LinkedIn conference back when I was in recruiting in the heyday of working 70 hours a week. And Ariana Huffington was speaking and she shared the story about how, you know, why is it that we rush to charge our little precious cell phones, right? Like if we look at our cell phone and we see that the batteries, oh no, I'm at 30%. Oh my gosh, I'm going down to 20%. We literally start freaking out. Like people can, I got to get charged. I have to stay connected. I have to know what's going on. And what's interesting is yet, if you view us as that, as human beings, we don't do this for ourselves, right? So it's thinking about if we could just charge our own personal batteries, our own personal energy, with as much zeal as we have about charging our stupid cell phones, you know, it's like, whew, I don't know, that that's always just stood out for me because I know how tethered I am, you know, to my cell phone and so many people are. So I have a question for you to consider. How do you monitor and take care of your own energy? Or do you? Just something to think about. There's no right or wrong answer. Nobody's bad for saying, I don't know that I do monitor that. Now is just an opportunity to consider that and start thinking about that. Okay, just a couple more slides here. Um, whoops. Resources. Again, these will all have hyperlinks to them so that um, when you get these, you'll be able to go directly to the sources. There's a couple of really great books. I put a book up here that's really important, I'm guessing, for people in the healthcare field. Um, Y'all are a very, very special breed and um, empathy has got to be huge at play for you. But also when you're an empath, it's a much easier for you to burn out and to get depleted. So this is a great book on um, how to not do that. And then a couple different articles on burnout, as well as some podcasts, and then a couple of websites that have a lot of great, helpful and useful information. And then I have two slides in here, which I don't need to go over, but this just kind of talk about if you're experiencing burnout, the work that I do, some my clients who I coach, what that coaching looks like. And then I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you guys today. Um, and thank you for letting me just talk about such a important topic. And I hope that maybe one thing sparked for you that you feel that you can help with yourself if you're experiencing burnout. Thank you so much, Lori. And, you know, uh, it makes me also think about, you know, in the unique world of health advocates, some of whom work in companies and some of whom work, you know, individually. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's even more important, I think, to connect with colleagues and make the time and the space and the structure to be able to do that. Because often, um, you know, people who might be on this call might be a little bit isolated from a larger organization. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big thing. I mean, that's again, a really hard part with COVID. And then you think about burnout and people are working from home now and they think, oh, it's great. I can, I can still do a load of laundry and I can do these things in my work day. But what they're finding is that they're actually working more because they're doing everything from home. So it's all, it just is nonstop, right? Yeah, I think um, a couple of the things that you said and um, also tied into some of what we heard at our annual conference last week was for advocates working with healthcare professionals, it is critically important to make sure you acknowledge our healthcare providers as people and what they may be going through. But also it really struck me the point that you made about streamlined communications. We heard that quite a bit. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking that probably a lot of people on this call have experienced why and how that's important. 
uh, in order to be effective in advocating for the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that. And we're um, we're up to our communication or our sorry our uh, Q and A time. And um, I know that Ray uh, Drazen, thank you so much for sending the email about or the chat about several recent articles that basically dismiss the possibility of herd immunity. So that was thank you for putting that out there because I hadn't seen that. And she also <laughs> asks, she also asked Yeah, that's Dale, why I called it nebulous. I don't yeah. I hate to blow the bubble totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then she also asks, what do you think of the idea that some women are delaying weaning so that their babies are protected from the virus? Have you heard that? I hadn't heard that. I, I haven't heard that big time, but I'm not surprised. And it's actually fine. Um, there are many cultures and many women that will breastfeed their kiddos till they're, you know, toddlers. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you, you do need to get them knowing how to eat real food. And, and a lot of times it comes down to more comfort than antibodies, but um, there's nothing wrong with that approach at all. Um, I just want them all to get vaccinated so that they have antibodies to pass along. Um, we are working really hard in our system to make um, vaccines available to those who have been um, hesitant during pregnancy. And we, we're, um, we've increased the number of days we can offer postpartum vaccinations. Um, it's not possible in every single setting, but that's another way to really make it as easy as possible. Because then when you go home with a new baby, it's hard for you to get access. Um, you know, your priorities change and you're, you're all protective and want to keep your baby close. Um, the other, one other thing I'll throw out there with, with new parents um, is that, um, it, you know, we're distant from family. Family can't necessarily come visit while you're in the hospital. Um, and people will start, be, start thinking about traveling around the holidays to go see family or vice versa, just to be super careful about that. Most pediatric care providers recommend not traveling. This is pre-pandemic um, with a baby that's three months or younger. Um, and so I think that pressures, and it speaks a lot to what Lori said when we, when, you know, being around family is really, you know, invigorating for many people. Um, it might be, might be triggering for others, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, I have found that, <laughs> yeah, that I really, um, you know, personal share. I my son and daughter-in-law are expecting um, in a few weeks, and I did a family-only shower. Everybody had to be flu and COVID vaccinated, and it was a small group, and it was just lovely to be able to hang out in in a in enclosed space, but with people that were taking really all the precautions, um, and uh, how important that is. Um, but the other thing we did is for the folks who couldn't come or weren't vaccinated, um, we did Zoom for during the opening of the present. So we did a hybrid and it was actually pretty cool, uh, easy to do, free uh, if you keep it short. So um, that's the other thing to think about protecting yourselves and still being able to connect with family, um, you know, through these holidays. Thanksgiving, I think, is uh, a really good time for us to be thankful for what we have um, and the family we have and the friends that we have, even if we can't be with them in person. So, um, and then, you know, I hug my dog a lot. <laughs> so he's on the meetings. Yeah. And Chip, <laughs> I know he talks a lot. <laughs> um, okay. So here's a question for Lori from Judy Finn. Are there things in the United States workplace culture that lead to burnout more than in other, mm. uh, in other countries in those cultures? Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know a list specifically of those things, but I do know just from some of the research that I've done in terms of you look at other, um, comp sorry, uh, I'm saying companies, other countries in terms of what they do with, you know, just the basics of even giving mothers more time off and fathers time off when it, when a child is born, that's just one example in terms of that and truly giving vacations, you know, um, there's a couple things around that. So yes, 
a lot of companies are now even starting to consider and look at, hey, why don't we just give unlimited vacation time? That's one thing that is starting to kind of happen in the U.S. more that they're looking at. Mm-hmm. The other thing is there's this thing about, well, if nobody else on my team is vac- taking vacation, I can't take it. Or I feel guilty if I'm leaving mm-hmm. somebody else's, right? So it really is, it's got to be role modeled. I mean, this really does come from leadership and the top down in terms of, hey, not only am I going to take vacation time, but guess what? You can't reach me. I'm not going to respond to email. I'm not going to respond to text. I'm not going to, you know, you need to figure it out without me being there, right? So yeah. there's some that, that is actually happening. And there's other things. Um, I always brag about this really amazing company in Seattle. It's a small startup of women um, and it's an HR company called mm-hmm. Revo. And they do things like, hey, we're going to do a team hike. Okay. We're going to go out and be outdoors instead of on zoom, talking about stuff that we would talk about over a meeting. That's one thing they're doing, giving their um, people the time to take off if they need it without questioning them. Like, do you really need to take the day off or is it, you know, it's, that should not be even a question. If somebody's requesting time off, take time off. Yeah. You know, again, we all need to recharge our own batteries. Right. So there's lots of little things that are starting to be considered and viewed. And it's, it's also not little things like, um, Hey, we've got, you know, I just think I, I come from tech, so I'm sorry. That's where my head, my heart goes sometimes, but you know, tech companies that are saying like, Hey, we've got cornhole and we've got unlimited, you know, all the food and junk food you can eat and the alcohol you can have. And that, I mean, that's not healthy either. So <laughs> You know, there right. are some things that are being done that aren't the best <laughs> examples, but I think people are really starting to open up and consider what can we really start doing at a much higher level because it does start with leadership and it starts with role modeling and taking downtime and taking time off and really asking your people and checking in with them with care and concern. How are you doing and what do you need? Right? There's Thank just you. not enough of that. And we need a lot more of that. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and there are a couple of um, COVID related topics, uh, questions here for Dale. Uh, this one from D. Totten. Uh, can you speak to the YouTube or sites that are warning about neuro disease effects after the vaccine? Mm. What do you say to folks that are asking about that? Maybe that's being brought up to advocates about what that is. Oh, yeah. I, the best I can say is um, there's no obvious long-term effect from the vaccines. Um, the things that we've seen with the vaccines that we know are real are rare, um, like the um, uh, cardiomyopathy, um, the kind of conductive cardiac issues that all have seemed to be self-limited. People are continuing to track that. And basically there's nothing that has the same effect that the wild disease does. And there's more and more we're learning about long COVID. We had um, excellent session on long COVID um, at our annual meeting. Uh, and the, the things that we're finding about how the, the COVID itself affects um, the um, neural pathways is pretty um, kind of frightening and, and uh, pretty, interesting because it's different than many, um, but not all. So we know, for instance, you can get Guillain-Barre um, from viruses. Um, you can also probably get them from virus-related vaccinations, but the COVID vaccines, the two Pfizer and Moderna are not based on that at all. Mm. So there are really, really rare um, circumstances of true anaphylaxis to some components of those, um, of those uh, new um, spike oriented uh, vaccines, but uh, pretty rare uh, when you think about all vaccines. Um, so I, I think that's how you have to have to look at it is, you know, your, your risk um, of exposure, your, and if you're vaccinated and you're not interested in a boost, still really need to be careful because get, even getting mild disease is not safe with this particular virus. Um, so yeah, and I know that um, I recently got the booster. They're still, well, not that recently, you know, you know in early October, um, I'm still getting um, the um, 
these safe communications asking if I've got new symptoms or whatever they're really trying to track. Um, so we'll get more and more. I think it's a little early to know about booster stuff, but even the vaccine in general. And the one other thing that was brought up during the annual meeting, which I think I mentioned once before, is people with long COVID, um, a decent percent are in seeing improvements in their symptoms after the vaccination. So it's almost like the, the whatever's going on with the leftover viral response is getting triggered enough that the body says, Oh, we got to fight this off. Mm -hmm. um, that's my, my, uh, my, uh, you know, somewhat um, made up version, but I think it's real um, in, in terms of what, why that would happen. There's a small percentage that that have worsening symptoms. So you, again, you as an individual have to balance that and the folks that you work with when you, in your advocacy role, I think um, you need to just let them know that there's balanced data and information. Go to the scientific sources if you can, rather than what's being put out on social media um, to, to, to balance your own decision, what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so uh, Beth, do you want to jump in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I wanted to um, ask Lori. So one of the things we get inquiries from people often who are struggling with being able to go with their, you know, their person or their client or their family member into hospital settings because there's so many reasons, right? They're understaffed, they are afraid of COVID, they... Mm -hmm. And so I think it must be challenging for hospitals right now mm. to be empathetic to this whole need for people to be taking time and being, you know, taking care of their person. And I'm just wondering if you've had any interaction with healthcare organizations or if you've heard, you know, of coaches being successful and working with them, because I would imagine it's really hard time for them. I'm sure Dale knows that because she's actually working in in that field. But, um, you know, I think personally advocates, nurses, doctors, whoever's, whatever job they're doing have to be able to do that themselves, even if their organization is not able. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there is, um, so the, the coaches that I know are a lot of executive coaches within mm -hmm. corporations, not mm -hmm. so much within healthcare, but mm -hmm. again, I'm a research freak, so I'm doing research. I, I literally get pings in my inbox. I have the word burnout in a Google search. So I get at least 30 different things a day. And so I'm just hungry for, you know, all the data. And I want to keep up on all the information that's going on out there in order to be good at my job. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I did find research that there are people that are working with coaches like at executive levels. And I, and I hate to say this, and I'm not saying this is where it starts, but it does start at some of those executive levels, right? So mm -hmm. it's those leaders getting coached and understanding what's important about what they value, what's important to them, how they can best serve the hospital or where they're working at in terms of all of their employees and truly what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And again, it's coming in and the ones that have been successful are the ones that come in and say, I can be humble about this. We need to be realistic about this. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to not know the answers, right? Yeah. It's okay to be vulnerable and say, Hey, we're in this together and we need to focus on this together. So in terms of a coach, not necessarily needing somebody who is a per se healthcare coach. Um, I'm sure there's coaches out there that, that focus mm -hmm. on that industry specifically, but at the end of the day, when it comes to coaching, honestly, and supporting, creating change in human beings and individuals at, at any level, um, you know, you can work with somebody who's a really good coach and they don't have to be specifically know everything there is to know about healthcare. You know, I've coached students, I've coached executives, I've coached 65, 70 year old women. So it's like a range, you know, I've coached executives of startups, um, executives within Amazon. So, um, you know, the work comes from within. It's about yeah. about change and creating change and making changes. I'm I'm curious about um, the question that you asked about monitoring burnout versus stress, mm -hmm. and if there are any um, tools or quick questions or you know sometimes in 
working with patients, we have them do that thermometer about, you know, where they feel like their health is from zero to one and kind mm-hmm. of place it on in that scale. Is there something like that, that uh, people can use either for themselves or their clients? Yeah. Well, there's, um, so there's one, there's a couple of different little apps, like in terms of mood, right. Which is tied into mm-hmm. how am I feeling? Um, honestly though, it starts with self-regulating. And I know that sounds easy, but again, the what, first, what, what is that? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doesn't have one. Personally do not understand it that. It doesn't sound easy. <laughs> I'll start with you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, honestly, it is about yeah, <laughs> really hard. I mean, I had to learn. And again, the only way I learned is because I had a massive burnout. I had a massive breakdown before I had my breakthrough, right? And now I'm really clear that I have to self-regulate because if I don't, I'm gonna turn into just this crazy spinning top that I always was. So what I mean by that is it just starts with something really simple, a check-in, that's all it is. Let me just check in with myself. And I know this sounds kind of a little TMI, but even for ladies, it's like, we're going crazy. Oftentimes for me, it's when I'm out and about doing things. And if I stop for a second and I just literally use the restroom and I know I'm going to have to sit for a second, it's like (sighs) deep breath. Like, okay, how, how am I feeling? What's going on for me right now? Am I doing okay? You know, but you have to be again, judgment-free and really, really open and vulnerable with yourself to say, how am I feeling? Because we don't know what to do, or we can't change anything until we first start to observe and witness and notice. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I do want to add just um, to, to Beth's question, I think, um, about the healthcare industry, because uh, burnout, as um, Lori noted, um, is something that's been a problem long before the pandemic. The pandemic has just made it worse. Um, And there are organizations that have been doing a lot of work in trying to minimize the things that add to burnout just in terms of daily practice. So it's the one thing as an individual to reach out and to self-regulate and to self-acknowledge if you're in a lot of stress and whether that's manageable stress or whether it's something where you have to to stop and do something differently. And also I think to build in, and I believe you mentioned this, Lori, just build in things in your day where you have to automatically stop, whether it's a walk, whether it's standing up, moving around away from your desk, whatever it is, and build in alarms if you have to, if you don't have that self-awareness. But um, if, for instance, um, when you look at providers, electronic medical records, it makes people crazy. They waste a ton of time. Yeah. So there's been a lot of work done with that. And how do we minimize that? Minimize number of clicks, minimize what we call pajama time. So you put in your whole day seeing patients and then you still have to go yeah. home and or stay late to finish all your documentation. Mm-hmm. So so that, that work hasn't stopped, but it, you know, it's really recognized that there are things you can do from a system perspective, as well as from an individual perspective to help minimize um, all of the, the um, burnout. And in Washington state, you actually, uh, an employer, at least the big employers, I don't know for small businesses, you actually can't ask why somebody's calling in sick. Um, you cannot explore that. And, um, and so we get, uh, let me just tell you, talk about tension. Um, and I mean tension, like rubber band tension. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have enough nurses. We have nurses calling in sick. They're probably not physically ill, but they need a break. Yeah. And uh, and so you've got this. Yeah, I get it for the person, but no, I don't get it for the patients that are walking through the door. So it's there's a ton of tension in all of the healthcare situations. It doesn't matter whether it's a clinic or whether it's an inpatient unit. There's not enough staff. And, and I think, have, yeah, and I think that's a good, a good place to, uh, we're right at time, but I think that's a good place for us yep. to stop today in terms of what the role of the advocate is, whether you're a professional advocate or you're helping family and friends, very important to just recognize and relate and be compassionate with our providers and be succinct in communication and also helping um, patients understand and take a breath 
to uh, make sure that they're going to get the care that they need and want in this very tension filled. Uh, I, I like the analogy of the rubber band tension filled uh, time period. So mm -hmm. just, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Dale Reisner and Lori Prutzman, and um, we will be sending you Lori's slides in a follow-up email with a survey as we always do. So please give your feedback. Uh, great to see you today. And we will be having a community conversation in November. We'll probably be focusing on the pill that's coming out and boosters and holiday time and a whole bunch of other things. And hopefully it'll be better news, fingers, fingers crossed. Let's all contribute to making it. So, all right, yeah. great to and see everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. take you. good care of yourselves too, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Aloha. Hi everyone. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs>